Kazakhstan has uh, has very skillfully uh, and very efficiently organized what are known as nominally multi-party elections in which a range of political parties participate. Uh, there is no level playing field because the ruling party, the party of the president, the party of the president in Kazakhstan is uh, informally uh, in a privileged position. So all the administrative resources, the entire propaganda machinery works to elect, not just to elect, but to ensure that that party wins maximum number of votes. Uh, so in theory, one has multi-party elections, multi-candidate elections, competition, uh, campaigns, uh, uh, the, uh, in theory opposition parties are also allowed some time uh, on the public state television. Uh, they are allowed considerable degree of freedom to present their program, but at the same time there's an inbuilt bias in the system. So, so the entire administration machinery, propaganda machinery also works to tell the people uh, fundamentally who is the right candidate and the right party for them to vote for. Nazarbayev has been the president since 1989 and he, to my mind, will continue to remain the president until his death unless he were to decide at some point to nominate a successor and, uh, and uh, relinquish power and, and still control uh, the new leadership. Uh, so, so Nazarbayev remains the president, but the prime minister uh, who is nominated by the president continues to change and in, in fact uh, the average uh, tenure of the prime minister has been about three years or so. Other members of the cabinet, people uh, within the presidential apparatus. All these people continue to change. In fact, they continue to be rotated. So, so there are certain individuals who constitute, to, uh, who, as I see, uh, who constitute the inner circle of the president, you know, the people the president has consistently relied on, the confidant of the president. So there are about a dozen people who have remained uh, in that internal circle, although they continue to be rotated within that inner circle. In 1992, about 40% of Kazakhstan's uh, population uh, consisted of uh, Russians, and there were another 6 or 7%, uh, 5 to 6%. Uh, Ukrainians and Belarusians, and then you had uh, about 5% Germans uh, in Kazakhstan who were uh, all, uh, who can broadly be classified as Russian speakers because Russian language was the, effectively the first language that they spoke and, and they were quite integrated in the Russian speaking culture. So uh, in 1991-92, roughly half the population of Kazakhstan consisted of Slavs and Europeans and uh, and other Russian-speaking groups. Since then, there has been a large-scale out-migration of Germans to predominantly to Germany, as well as uh, of uh, Russians, Ukrainians, uh, Belarusians, Slavs, uh, mainly to Russia. About two million uh, Russian speakers, who include the Germans, uh, or about eight to nine percent of the population of Kazakhstan has left Kazakhstan over the last uh, 16, 17 years. Currently, the share of ethnic Russians in Kazakhstan is about uh, 26 percent, and if one includes the Ukrainians and Belar uh, Belarusians, then I would say that about 30 to 31 percent of the population is. Uh, of Slavs in Kazakhstan. There hasn't been any identifiable sense of community among Russians 
in Kazakhstan ever. So what I'm suggesting is that there have been large number of Russians in Kazakhstan, but they don't form a kind of cohesive community that looks up to Russia as its homeland. There are many Russians uh, in Kazakhstan, and when I here when I'm talking about Russians, well, I, I think I should be using the word Russian speakers because uh, the the Russians or the Slavs, particularly in the northern and eastern regions of Kazakhstan, are very intermixed. So within one family, you will have a mix of Ukrainian, Russian, Polish, uh, Jewish, and German, and and and, and other blood. So, so there is nothing, there is no, no such thing as a pure Russian. In early 1990s, Kazakhstan and all other Central Asian states were quite dependent on Russia uh, for export of goods as well as for, uh, for various essential commodities. Kazakhstan produces great deal of oil uh, and has vast, uh, is very rich in mineral resources. But again, it was dependent in 1990s on, completely dependent on pipelines that go via Russia and, and then to the outside world. Uh, it was also dependent on Russia for various, uh, for processing of its mineral resources. Uh, and the uh, the vast uh, majority of exports uh, of Kazakhstan and also imports to Kazakhstan were either from Russia or through Russia. But since then, there has been a steady uh, shift in this kind of uh, pattern of dependency on Russia. And, and again, this is quite a natural result of these uh, countries becoming sovereign and independent is they are looking for for other outlets and, and Kazakhstan has very clearly uh, stated that it wants to diversify its economic relations, its foreign relations, they are pursuing what they call a multi-vectoral foreign policy so, so they recognize the geopolitical location of Kazakhstan which requires it to develop closer ties with vast number of its neighbors rather than depending, singu depending singularly on Russia. So over last decade and a half, Kazakhstan's trade with China has been uh, growing very, very rapidly. Very soon, China will replace Russia as the number one trading partner of Kazakhstan if it already hasn't replaced Russia. So there's that clear trend, and it's not just Kazakhstan, but other Central Asian states uh, are also uh, reflecting that trend of uh, greater economic, uh, growing volume of trade with China and reduction in the volume of trade with Russia. Uh, Kazakhstan has, uh, has also increased uh, its exports, its oil exports to the West, particularly to the European Union. Uh, and about 80% of its oil exports uh, are made through pipelines that go through Russia. So in that sense, Russia still provides very important transit route. Women in Kazakhstan, as elsewhere, in Central Asia and the former Soviet uh, republics have occupied a uh, very active position in various uh, sectors of the economy. Uh, women historically in the Soviet times uh, were quite active uh, in the labor force and in, in Russia we find that in the post Second World War period uh, women outnumbered men because vast proportion of men died or uh, were uh, disabled during the war, so, so women were extremely active in the workforce. And this, there has been a similar legacy of war in, in Central Asia as well. Uh, but what one finds in the post-Soviet uh, political system is that, uh, and, and this is a trend that continues from Soviet times as well, that even during the Soviet times, despite the Soviet state's rhetoric of uh, equality of gender and uh, 
and all the freedom granted to women and the emancipation of women and so forth, there was in fact uh, very little representation of women at higher uh, level in politics. There were no women top, uh, there were no women members of the, Soviet, the Politburo. Uh, none of the first secretaries of the various republics were women. So women occupied uh, various positions at the lower and, and middle levels in the government, in the party structure, but not at the top level. Uh, this trend has gotten even worse in the post-independence period. Eight percent of ministerial positions are occupied by, by women, so it is a male-dominated system uh, very much. And uh, that is unlikely uh, to change in the uh, in the near future, and even if the Kazakhstani government were to take measures to increase the representation of women in the parliament uh, and and in other political uh, uh, positions, that in itself will not suggest that there has been a study of further empowerment of women because these women would still be members of the same uh, uh, ruling political party and, and would still be subject to the similar kind of relationships of patronage and distribution of power that characterizes the general political system.